Hello and welcome to another episode of the World War II podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. We have a great topic for you this episode. I was aware the Russians had a spy operating in Tokyo during the war and that from him the Soviets were sent some highly accurate intelligence. But that's about all I knew. And that really undersells the story of Richard Sorge. His father was German, his mother Russian. Working under the guise of a freelance journalist, he managed to infiltrate the highest echelons of German and Japanese society. His information proved pivotal, informing the Russians of the Japanese intention not to attack Siberia, which would allow the Soviets to transfer vital troops west for the Battle of Moscow. Ian Fleming described Sorge as the most formidable spy in history. Joining me to discuss Sorge is Owen Matthews. Owen is the former Moscow and Istanbul bureau chief for Newsweek magazine and has just released a biography of uh, Sorge, an impeccable spy, Richard Sorge, Stalin's master agent. It's a cracking read and I thoroughly enjoyed it. But before I start, I'd like to take a moment to thank all those people who have become patrons of the podcast. They help me find the time to work on the show. I hope you guys find the extras I make exclusively available to patrons interesting. If you're not already signed up, it's super simple. Go to patreon.com slash w2podcast. By becoming a patron, you commit to a dollar or two each month. And in return, you can bask in the rosy glow of satisfaction from helping me fund the podcast. Whilst listening to the extras I try to put out that are history related, but perhaps not specific to the current topic. So to find out more, go to patreon.com forward slash ww2podcasts and you'll find a short video there of me explaining how it all works. Owen, thanks for joining me. If we're looking at Russia's top spy during the war, let's start at the beginning. Richard uh Sorge. Is that, is that is that surname? Is it German or is it Russian? Oh, it's a German so- surname, and it's um, a very unusual and strange surname because it's also um, it's a word. It means melancholy, which is uh, a rather inappropriate word for the character of this spy. He was really, I mean, he may have been occasionally melancholy, but mostly he was uh, he was sort of manic and uh, <laughs> exceptionally charming and extremely energetic. Um, and Zorga, in fact, in fact, means Zorga means melancholy in German. Um, it's funny because it's a strange to me. To me, my un- uncouth, uh, uh, you know, dreadful language skills. It sounds quite. It sounds quite Russian. <laughs> it's one of the strange things about this man is that he, um, uh, to all intents and purposes, and the people that he met were uh, took him to be a good German and you know classic. Um, you know, one of the main ways in which he charmed Germans of his own generation was uh, through what the Germans call Kampfkameraderie, you know, the, the, the comradeship of the trenches, because he had served in the First World War. And he was this sort of hearty German. People thought that he was a parodic Berliner, sort of slightly rude, slightly uncouth, um, heavy drinking, very charming, uh, r- 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 sort of roused about classic German. But of course, the strange thing is that he had a Russian mother. Um, he was born in a German expatriate family um, in Baku in the Russian Empire. Well, his, where his father had been working as an oil engineer, and he later became a banker. But his mother was uh, was Russian. Strangely enough, um, never taught him Russian. So <laughs> when Zorge, as a young communist, was recruited by the Soviets after a period of working in the German Communist Party in uh, the early 20s and just after the First World War, uh, Zorge is recruited by the Soviets, and he goes to Moscow, the land of international communism in uh, in the early 20s and he has to learn russian from scratch because his own russian mum has never taught him any we mentioned the war there i mean so much uh, uh, so much sort of comes back to the war i mean i guess it did for a lot of men during this period as almost like an anchor point what was his first world war experience like did, had he volu- did he volunteer for the uh, german army in 1914 or 
later. You, you're, you're right that it's the wellspring of his entire life, actually, um, um, and not just for Zorgi. Um, he volunteers. He's a young student, and he's, uh, in fact, on holiday, on a sort of walking holiday in, uh, in Sweden the, when war breaks out in August 1914. And he rushes back with his, with his friends, and without even telling his parents, he signs up for a student battalion. Uh, what were later tragically referred to as the uh, as the Berlin Mayflies, because they were deployed to the front line at Ypres and were uh, massacred in large numbers because they were very poorly trained. So um, for Zorge, who went through the entire war, um, he was wounded three times. Um, he was on the Western Front, then on the Eastern Front. He discovered, like many people of that generation, uh, many Germans of that generation, that the orthodoxies by which they'd lived their lives were false and hollow and this sort of naive patriotism that drove him to the recruiting station in 1914 was just deluded. One of the, for one of the best descriptions of that, um, you read Adolf Hitler's 1925 memoir, yeah. Mein Kampf. Because for Hitler, he writes about this, the, the Kindermord, the massacre of the innocents, this massive betrayal of the older, you know, by the older generation of the younger generation, this senseless slaughter. Ironically, for communists like Richard Zorge and for fascists like Hitler, the, that anger against the old world has exactly the same wellspring. It's the senseless blood and slaughter and pointless massacre that they experienced in the First World War. And ironically, they were actually, Zorge and Hitler were both wounded. They were both corporals and they were both wounded. And they were actually in Berlin hospitals very close to each other uh, in 1916. So um, that experience was incredibly formative for a whole generation. Uh, that comradeship of the trenches made an immediate bond between Zorge because he was a war hero. He got the Iron Cross, second class. He has had a visible limp from his war injuries. And uh, he, was a, he was a war hero. And it Im immediately created a bond, even with people... Uh, later in his life, who could have been a terrible threat to Zorge, you know, not senior Nazis. And immediately when he sort of got, you know, got them into a bar and across a table with a, a few couple of pints of beer, immediately there was that comradeship um, that was, uh, you know, the key to his, to his social connections and to his, you know, um, and, and to his espionage, in fact. So he becomes involved with the International Comintern. So what, I presume it's war, his wartime experiences turn him towards communism as opposed to going, going the other way. Um, how does he get from the International Comintern to spying for the Russians? Well, interestingly, um, the Communist International um, is, was founded by Lenin on Leninist principles in order to unite the communists of various countries around the world led by Moscow. And the led by Moscow part is really important because, in fact, in, in 1917, no one thought, least of all, by the way, Karl Marx or Frederick Engels, the ideological founders of communism, no one thought that Russia would be the first country in the world to become a socialist state. It was an entire surprise to everybody. So when the Bolshevik Revolution happens in, um, in Russia in, in 1917, the, the Russian Bolshevik party is by no means the strongest or the most popular um, communist party in the world. The German communist party is, uh, has many more people and many more members and has a much stronger chance of taking over. And everyone is convinced through the, through the, 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 the immediate aftermath of the German defeat in World War I that Germany is about to go communist and there's, depending on how you count it there's about five or six various revolutions through, during that period and Zorge and hundreds of thousands of other young, angry, deluded young men are fighting for the cause of international communism in Germany obviously Germany did not become a communist state those disappointed communists drifted towards Moscow and Moscow was very happy to gather them under the banner of the Communist International because Lenin and his successors wanted to dominate world revolution. You know, the Soviet communism, right from the get-go, had a very strong Russian imperialistic streak to it, actually. They uh, gathered all these international communists together. They trained them in Moscow. They kept a very close eye on them. And they also used the Communist International, the Soviets used the Communist International as an international spying ring. 
So Zorgi actually gets his start in spying in the Communist International, and he gets sent on various missions to Europe and sort of checking in on the state of local parties and, um, you know, very sort of uh, low-grade stuff. But um, by the end of the 1920s, Stalin, who's already establishing his control of the Soviet Union and the, and the Soviet Communist Party, decides that, he, that the Communist International is a little bit too heterodox and a little bit too independent and a little bit too dangerous. So he starts to crush, squash, marginalize the Communist International. And at the same time, the fledgling intelligence services that Stalin is creating, most notably the military intelligence, the outfit that we now know as the GRU, the Russian military, Russian military intelligence, starts to cherry-pick various foreign communist cadres from the wreckage of the Communist International's espionage system. And one of those is Richard Zorge, because he turns out to be rather good at his job. And he's sort of, uh, he's recruited, he's spotted and recruited and put to work by uh, Jan Berzin, who's the, who's, uh, the founder of uh, Soviet military intelligence. So what's, what is um, motivating uh, Sorry, is it money? Is it adventure? Or is it really idealism? It's, uh, it's definitely not money, uh, which is not to say that there was not a materialistic element to his, uh, to his character. Um, I think he was a committed communist. I think he, he clearly was, certainly at this early period. I think he liked to play his cover story, was of a uh, sort of a roused about high-living German uh, journalist, and when he was deployed to Shanghai, which was his first deployment for Soviet military intelligence, uh, he found that role entirely to his liking. He was a soldier <laughs> of the revolution, but his personal battleground was, you know, the, the dance halls and the whorehouses and the bars and the restaurants <laughs> of, uh, of, of uh, pre-war Shanghai. And in fact, it was not entirely frivolous because in those restaurants and dance halls and whorehouses, he uh, wined and dined various German officers who were uh, working for the nationalist government in Nanking and were getting lots of good information uh, from them. So his, his motivation was primarily ideological. He found the job to his liking. But the really interesting part of that question is what really of his motivation is um, his personality, and this is the the, the big mystery, uh, uh, which I'm not sure I really ever solve. The, the mystery is, like, what drives a man to deceive everybody around him for years? And it's clearly some kind of strange sort of pathology. I mean, this is it's not normal behavior. And it's something that you see in many other great spies as well. I mean, you know, Kim Philby was apparently pathologically driven to deceive everybody around him and after mm. kim philby defected to moscow from beirut the first thing that philby does on arrival in moscow is seduce his best friend donald mclean's wife so clearly there's 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 something in the character of a spy that it's it's not just ideological it's not just a job there's something in it that makes them um that that, that, that drives them to live a life of of, of deceit and treachery how did he take to Shanghai? I mean, he's not an Asian expert when they send him out there, is it? I presume he's never been in that part of the world. And he goes out there as a German, as a German freelance journalist, he somehow gets himself uh, papers for. Do we need movement papers at this time of uh, the early you know, early, we're not early 20s, are we? Late 20s? He basically makes himself an instant expert on China, which is possible. I mean, you know, the foreign correspondents get shifted around the world all the time. Every few years, you get a new posting and you become an, ex an instant expert on your new posting. And so do diplomats. So it's not, it's not unheard of. I mean, clearly, he was, you know, intelligent. He had a doctorate in, uh, in economics. He very quickly ingratiated himself, and this is his real talent, was not really as, a, as, a, as an analyst, but as someone who was extraordinarily good at networking. So what he does is that he, in the, in the space of um, a few weeks... Um, he sort of uh, gathers all kinds of credentials and letters of recommendation and uh, you know, freelance letters confirming his assignments for various newspapers. And he does it for Shanghai just before he's posted there. And he does the same again for when he's reposted a few years later in 1933 to Tokyo. 
and he hides in plain sight because the usual practice of Soviet military intelligence or, or Soviet intelligence, or certainly of Comintern intelligence up to that point, had been to invent sort of various complicated false identities, which they called a boot, actually, your false, a suborg. So your false identity was your boot. But, but, but you know, those were sort of prone to, be, to fall apart and be unconvincing. Whereas Zorge was entirely convincing because he hid in, in plain sight. He didn't, he didn't pretend to be anything that he was not. He was, in fact, a German freelance journalist. He was writing all these articles, and he was quite good at them, so he became quite successful at his job. Uh, what he did hide was his parallel career, which is as an international spy. He was very good and quick to ingratiate himself, and he clearly had a key component of any journalistic career is an ability to very quickly convince everyone that you know what you're talking about. <laughs> I forget which uh, which 20th, there, there was an early 20th century press baron, I think it was uh, Northcliffe, Beaverbrook, I forgot. He said that journalism is the art of, of explaining to other people what one doesn't understand oneself. <laughs> you know, in, in, in a few months, he made himself in a world a world expert on on China and was was taken seriously by the by the German press for whom he wrote he had been active as you say in Germany at the end of the war as sort of openly as a communist he goes back to to get you know new press accreditation when the Russians wanted to send him to Tokyo was it not a risky thing going back to Berlin in what was it thirty three he goes back he, he he seeks press accreditation I think does he also apply for the Nazi party membership I mean it shows a certain sort of chutzpah that he could surely have been found out as a communist you 're absolutely right. It was a calculated risk he 's you know so the, the nineteen thirty three in Germany in berlin the the Nazis have only just come to power the Gestapo. The Geheime Staatspolizei, the, the 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 internal security service of the Reich, has just been set up. So Zorge, who by that point has been living for um, uh, for nearly ten, for nearly ten years in in Russia and has spent two of those years in in Shanghai, is sent back into the heart of the Nazi establishment to indeed apply for Nazi Party membership and to apply for all these accreditations at the risk that some policeman is going to look up his personal file and discover that he's been arrested for fighting with communists in Aachen and thrown out of uh, mines in Zollingen for being a, a communist agitator. And he's, you know, he's, he has like a, a, a thick police file. It's never found. The theory has been advanced that there was some communist protector either in the secret police or in some other part of the German bureaucracy that somehow protected Zorge and hid those files. Because when the Germans attempted to... Um, and did a background check on him rather later in his career, when he was already a trusted friend of the German ambassador to Tokyo and was already writing... Sorge was already writing confidential reports about the Japanese economy um, for the German army. The Germans again do a background check on him in 1940, no, 41. And they discover all these files. So clearly, you know, they must have been lying in plain sight. It's just that I think in 1933, he was lucky. And he was devilishly lucky through his whole career. But the, the result of his uh, foray into to Berlin to round up all his accreditations was, in fact, the key to his success in the most important part of his espionage career, which was in Tokyo from 1933 to 1941. And that was he got the introductions to various, you know, key... Germans who were working in Tokyo, and that became the basis of his uh, of one of the greatest spying careers of uh, of all time. So, uh, yeah, so he sent to Tokyo, you know, traditional to Tokyo, to Japan, to, you know, traditionally suspicions of foreigners. I presume it was you know he's going for you know Shanghai is an international city, certainly. You know, uh, posting to Tokyo must be uh, presumably very difficult, dif different. Insular, the, the expat community must be a, a lot smaller. Yes, exactly. So, so Tokyo is a really hard target for espionage in the 1930s because, as you say, Shanghai is a large, chaotic city. It has it has five different police forces: the Chinese police, the International Settlement Police, who are basically 
British, uh, the French cantonment police, the various international concessions, uh, basically colonies in Shanghai, all have their different security services. Tokyo is, is a unitary state. It's a totalitarian, uh, it's a monarchy, um, notionally has democratic after the first, uh, after the Meiji Revolution, but actually through the 1930s it gets more uh, militaristic, more authoritarian. The spy suspicion grows. Foreigners are much rarer on the streets of Tokyo. They're, they're two a penny in, in, in Shanghai. But, you know, just in purely physical terms, a foreigner is extremely visible, especially one who's six foot two, like, like Richard Zorge. You know, he sticks out like a sore thumb, and he's extremely high profile, which makes it all the more remarkable that he managed to create this extraordinary espionage network. And in fact, he is all created two espionage networks. Uh, one of them was based on his sort of by now traditional uh, channel of information, which was making friends with Germans at the embassy, uh, military attaches and so on pumping them for information, becoming their friends. Um, but also the Russian Soviet military intelligence basically um, orders him to hook up with uh, one of his old associates uh, from Shanghai days, who's a, a, a Japanese journalist called Hotsumi Ozaki, who's a communist, but very importantly, not a member of the Japanese Communist Party officially. Hotsumi Ozaki is basically recruited by Zorge and becomes uh, his, uh, his, his, uh, his key Japanese agent. So what makes Zorge's espionage ring so successful is that uh, in time, his Zorge's best German friend, Eugen Ott, who starts off as a deputy military attaché, rises to rank of German ambassador to Japan. His, his Japanese agent, Hotsumi Ozaki, uh, pursues the not entirely unknown career path of journalist to analyst and pundit to government advisor and eventually ends up on what's called the Breakfast Group, which is a uh, group of senior advisors to the Japanese Prime Minister. So uh, within a few years, Zorge finds himself one degree of separation from Adolf Hitler because his best mate... <laughs> Eugen Ott, the German ambassador, regularly speaks to Hitler, goes to, travels to Berlin, talks to Hitler. One degree of separation from uh, the Japanese Prime Minister, because uh, was, um, Zorge's uh, Japanese agent is having breakfast with him every day. And one degree of separation from Stalin, because all this time uh, Zorge is reporting back to uh, the various heads of Soviet military intelligence who are seeing Stalin every day. So that's, uh, he finds himself um, one degree of separation from those three radically different points of, uh, of power, which become rather strategically important when the question of where Japan stands in the war becomes critical. Yeah, it's, it's almost like Ozaki and uh, Zoge always have a s parallel careers sort of in uh, from journalism to analysts because Zoge also starts to get embroiled working for the German em working for the German embassy, not just friends with the ambassador, does he? Uh, which I think the ambassador he met through he, that was one of his fortuitous letters of introduction from Berlin, wasn't it? Is that that's how he? They they they, they have a very. Um, distant, in Zorge's case, mutual acquaintance. Uh, one of the editors whom Zorge badges for accreditation in 1933 uh, says, oh, like an old friend of mine happens to be in Japan right now, and this guy is Lieutenant Colonel, as he was then, Eugen Ott. And Zorge travels to Nagoya, an industrial city, where Ott and his family have been uh, posted to, uh, as, as uh, sort of military attaches to a Japanese um, uh, artillery division. And just because there's no Germans around, Ott and Zorge, the crucial, the central human relationship of this entire spy story, really have nothing in common because Ott is a rather straight-laced, rather by-the-book um, German officer. In fact, he had been formerly an intelligence officer in, fact, in the World War One. Ott had been involved, in fact, in secretly negotiating a uh, gold for arms deal between the f fledgling Weimar Republic and the fledgling Bolshevik state, because they had the, 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 the Bolsheviks had been uh, selling the, the Germans arms right through the 20s and continued to do so right up until the rise of Hitler. So Ott had been um, involved in 
in a bit of intelligence work. But basically, he's like a very straight-laced, very uh, conservative German officer. Whereas um, Zorke is this sort of wild, hard-drinking, womanizing journalist who likes nothing better than to ride around town on his fast motorcycle and crash cars and crash his motorcycles and so on. So it's a very improbable friendship. And it's a friendship that... Uh, Zorge very perversely appears to do everything to endanger right at the get-go because um, one of the first things he does after befriending Ott is to seduce Ott's wife, uh, Helma Ott, which is, uh, I call the book An Impeccable Spy because it's, uh, that's a quote from Kim Philby. Kim Philby said that Zorge's work was impeccable. But um, in fact, in many ways, in terms of tradecraft, Zorge's work was very far from impeccable. I mean, that seems to be an incredibly stupid, reckless and very dumb thing to do. You know, this man is going to be the, the cornerstone of your espionage career and the first thing you do is you, you seduce his wife. But so charming is Zorge and so, and, and so strange is the relationship between Eugen and Helma Ott uh, is that the, uh, the future ambassador, Eugen Ott, just brushes off this charming journalist's affair with his wife and, in fact, teases Zorge. He calls him the, the irresistible one. I'm not sure whether it's a character flaw on Ott's part or whether it's preternatural charm on Zorge's part, but, or probably a bit of both. But uh, Zorge very quickly becomes not just a friend, but a very trusted advisor to Ott. Partly it's a personal because, you know, Ott confides an enormous amount of information, confidential information that he shouldn't be imparting. Uh, right up to when he's ambassador, he continues to basically treat Zorge as his you know, confidential secretary, as his confidant. He shares almost everything with Zorge. There's also a practical element to it, and this is kind of the genius of Zorge's setup. I mean, I mentioned a moment ago that he ran two parallel intelligence networks, one through his friendship with the German ambassador, the other through his signed up agent Hotsumi Ozaki and the point was that he used that information coming from two sources to create a kind of intelligence mill an information exchange so to Ott he Zorge explains all the internal gossip and ins and outs of the workings of Japanese politics which he's learned from Ozaki and very quickly gains a reputation for being the best informed foreign correspondent in Tokyo and has an extraordinarily detailed and mysterious knowledge of the inner workings of the Japanese state. Not surprisingly, because he's got a spy there. And for Ozaki, Ozaki gets a reputation for being amazingly well informed about the intentions of you know the European powers and especially the Germans, because Zorge is telling him what is passing on what he's hearing from Ott. So Ott's reputation is being bigged up, grown by the information that Zorge is passing him uh, about Japan. Ozaki's reputation is being bigged up um, and growing his career thanks to the information that he's getting from uh, Eugen Ott, the German ambassador. So, and in the middle of all this is Zorge. Uh, he's you know, passing information backwards and forwards. Very quickly, the Germans want to use him in an official capacity. They offer several times for him to be uh, a full-time member of the diplomatic staff. Uh, and ironically, he was, of course, I believe, the only person to have been a, uh, both a member of the uh, German Nazi Party and the Soviet Communist Party at the same time. But they even offered him to, to a leadership of the Tokyo chapter of the Nazi Party. That's how, that, that, that's, that's how, how good a Nazi he was. Which, which makes you wonder in this curious sort of, uh, in, in the Stalinist purges of the late 1930s, you know, how does that go down uh, when their top spy in Tokyo is so close to the German embassy? You know, in this atmosphere of distrust, how is he uh, viewed in Moscow? Well, that's, that, 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 that's a brilliant question. And, and it's, it's, it's one of the, it's ultimately the, 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 the tragedy of Zorge's career is that if anybody knows anything about Zorge, it is this, and that is that Zorge is known as the man who warned Stalin that Hitler was going to invade in June of 1941 and was ignored, was disbelieved, and the root, and that, which is true. The root of that disbelief, as you exactly rightly say, is the purges. And Zorge was one of the very few agents 
um, f- who were in the Soviet military intelligence apparatus at the beginning to survive until the beginning of the war because um, successive waves of purges decimated not, not just the Soviet party cadres, not just the, um, the Soviet army, um, the upper echelons of the Soviet army were completely decimated during the purges, but also all the great Soviet agents, including Theodore Marley, the guy who, who recruited the Cambridge Five, I and mean, all the great illegals of the 1920s and early 30s were summoned to Moscow, in 1937, and the, particularly the beginning of 1938, uh, for, consul- for talks and consultations. All of them were summoned. Uh, not all of them went. Some of them refused to return because they realized that they were being lured back to their deaths. Uh, so the, the ones that did return were all either shot, including Theodore Marley, and or imprisoned. And there was a very tiny subcategory of one, who is Richard Zorge, who agreed to return but didn't return. Uh, and, and I think not, for, uh, not, not because of guile, I think it was luck, because he said, yes, I will obey your order, except that you know, one of my sub-agents is now you know, on a reporting trip in Manchuria, and I have to wait till he gets back, and then I have been asked by Ott to take a diplomatic parcel to so-and-so. There, there are various practical reasons that prevent him from returning to the massacre uh, in the beginning of 1938. And then when he's finally ready to go, he, the boss who had summoned him has been shot. The successor of the boss who summoned him has also been shot. The successor of the successor has been shot. Between 1936 and 19, uh, 1939, uh, there are six successive directors of Soviet military intelligence, all of whom are shot. By the time Zorg is ready to go back, they say, like, oh, no, you know, we don't want you to come back. You know. But... Fatally, that uh, label of being a, what the Russians call a, a nevozvrashenets, literally a person who has not gone back, sticks with him. And so for the rest of his career, which turns out to be the incredibly important part of his career, from 1938 onwards, in the wake of the purge, he survives, Zorge survives, but he's never really entirely trusted. And that's a terrible disaster for the Soviet Union because the intelligence that Zorge is providing from Japan um, is you know, absolutely gold-plated. It's probably the, the, the greatest and best uh, sourced information that any spy has ever, has ever produced on so many fronts. Well, the fascinating thing is that he's, he's in Japan in, and actually he's getting so much vital information about Germany rather than uh, Japan. Um, you know, how much could he tell Moscow about the up- upcoming Operation Barbarossa? How much did he get wind of? The crucial thing about Barbarossa is that Zorge kept Moscow abreast of everything that he was hearing from a series of German military attaches who were going backwards and forwards to Berlin. Because, of course, until the night of the 22nd of June 1941, Germany and the Soviet Union were actually in a non-aggression pact, the Ribbentrop-Molotov pact that was signed in 1939. So the, the quickest way to go from Berlin to Tokyo was to take a train, you got on a train in Berlin, you, took, you got off the train at, uh, at Moscow, changed for the Trans-Siberian Express, and you were there in seven days. So during that pre-war period, there was a constant stream of senior military officers going directly from Moscow to Tokyo. So it's not just hearsay evidence. These are people who are actually, uh, firstly, know Zorge because he's been there for you know, eight years at that point, and, he's, and he knows many of these people personally, of these military officers personally, and they're his drinking buddies, and they're keeping him abreast of the plans of Barbarossa as they see it. And he's updating the Soviets on what he hears on a regular basis. Uh, One of the things that's frustrating for Zorge and uh, what unfortunately undermines his credibility with his Soviet masters is that uh, he keeps reporting different dates, and the reason why he keeps to, uh, reporting different dates is, of course, that famously Hitler kept delaying Operation Barbarossa yeah. fatally. Uh, so it's not, it's not really Zorge's fault that he didn't actually <laughs> predict the date. It was the fact that the Germans themselves kept, kept, kept delaying it. I mean, firstly, they were uh, trying to invade, invade Britain, seeing, seeing whether they could revive a, 
an invasion of Britain in the spring of 1941. And then they had a swipe at Yugoslavia and so on. So the, um, the actual date of Operation Barbarossa keeps getting moved back. But one of the most important things about the warnings of Barbarossa is that Zorge was one of 19 agents who uh, warned Stalin who, 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 of, of Barbarossa. There was a whole espionage network inside Nazi Germany called the Rote Kapelle, the Red Choir, that was also in various senior positions. There was a Luftwaffe officer, there was a foreign ministry uh, official who um, were passing bits and pieces of information to the Soviets. And all of this information was coming into the headquarters of Soviet military intelligence to the successor of all those dead shot men, Philip Gorlikov. And General Gorlikov uh, realizes, having accepted this rather unenviable position where all of his predecessors have been shot dead, that the way not to be shot dead is just to tell the boss what he wants to hear. And that is, it's a really classic, fatal example of historical groupthink. Uh, because in a sort of vicious circle, really, is that the head of, head of intelligence is like cherry-picking all the bits of information that cast doubt on the reality of a German invasion of the USSR in 1941. And that reinforces Stalin's disbelief. And because Stalin disbelieves it, then the head of intelligence thinks that he doesn't want to hear it. Philip Gorlikov does a fatal disservice, not just to his agents who are risking their lives in various places around the world, including Zorge in Tokyo, to get him this information. But he's also, you know, frankly betraying his, 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 his country and his service. And, and you see it in the archives. You, you see the original radiograms that Zorge is sending, and you see the reports that Gorlikov is putting on Stalin's desk, and they're completely different. Or rather, they're just you know filleted. They're just cherry picked, and the result is that you know in in June of 1941, um, the Soviet Union is totally unprepared for a war with uh, with Germany. So is the first part of his downfall his radio operator? Is it Max Clausen in the cleaner telling the police he gets up in the night and fiddles with a with a box with silver knobs on, which is a great description of of presumably his radio. <laughs> Rather than some strange euphemism. <laughs> well, well, interestingly, I mean, one one of the strange things is, and one 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 of the striking things is that Zorge is actually quite good at tradecraft. I mean, his his meetings, Zorge's meetings with Hatsumi Ozaki are never observed. They're always very careful, despite this you know, insane spy mania. They're never caught red-handed. What really goes wrong is that actually Zorge has a network of sub-agents. And he has a Japanese, a Japanese born in California, in fact, uh, Miyagi, uh, Yoshiko Miyagi, who's sent out as an agent by the Soviets to help in the, in the, in the spy ring. He's actually an artist and gives no sign at the beginning of his career of being in any way useful to aspiring. But it turns out that Miyagi actually is rather, is rather sort of personable and charming and sort of, and he has a sort of goofy grin. And he's actually rather good at, uh, speaking to ordinary people like sort of soldiers and dock workers and the, you know uh, so it, it's not just prime ministers and ministers that um, have information it's also you know the little people know the, the, the nuts and bolts of what's going on he asks soldiers are they being issued with summer uniforms or winter uniforms and that's really important in the summer of 1941 because if they're being issued with summer <laughs> uniforms that means that they're going to be sent south to the Philippines, to the Dutch East Indies, to French uh, Indochina. Uh, if they're being issued with winter uniforms, that means that the plan is going ahead to invade the Soviet Union in concert with the uh, Japan's German allies. But the problem is that Miyagi starts to recruit his own agents. So Zorge's agents start to recruit agents. So there's already like a sort of secondary spy ring going on, sort of beyond Zorge's control. And those agents in turn... Re- recruit other informers so there's a whole sort of sort of web of espionage that's being won by as being spun by you know untrained agents who are in theory in the spy ring but about whom Zorge doesn't really have any knowledge one one, one of these uh, associates of Miyagi uh, gets arrested because she's actually a former communist and uh, she gets arrested interrogated and the spy ring unravels that way you know from the bottom up you know, they, and the Japanese police just sort of follow the chain up and start arresting people, and they get to uh, Miyagi. Miyagi is arrested, and he attempts to kill himself. Um, he, he, he throws himself out of the window 
of the police station in which he's being interrogated. Um, he charges out of the window, fourth floor window, or third floor window, and uh, is extremely surprised as he's, uh, as he's falling to note that his interrogator has jumped out after him. <laughs> <laughs> that's how that's how dedicated the Japanese police interrogator was. So they both land uh, fortuitously for them uh, uh, in in a bush and both survive. Uh, Miyagi is so is so impressed and so shocked that his in, in, interrogator is willing to risk his life by also jumping out of the third floor window after him. That that's the moment that he breaks and he tells the Japanese police about. Um, uh, about his activities um, and uh, it leads them to Ozaki and Ozaki leads them to Zorgi. So um, the, the spy ring is sort of unravelled entirely through bad luck. When he's picked up, when Zorgi's picked up, I wonder if he had any realistic hope of either the Russians or perhaps, or perhaps even the Germans bailing him out if he could play his cards right. Well, exactly. I mean, the, the, this is one of the great sort of might have beens of the, of the Zorgi story. So when the Japanese arrest Zorge, they are convinced that he is a German spy, that he's working for the Germans, because he does indeed, uh, he has an office in the German embassy, he's not a, an accredited diplomat, but he's um, still working as a correspondent for the uh, Frankfurter uh, Zeitung, Germany's most prestigious paper, um, you know, like the equivalent of the New York Times correspondent or something. Mm. Uh, but he also runs a, a sort of newsletter in the embassy. He has a, an office in the embassy. He's known to be close to the ambassador. They have great difficulty in believing that this Nazi, who's so close to the German embassy, could actually be a Soviet spy. Uh, and the Germans themselves also find this ridiculous. You know, there, there's a letter from all the foreign correspondents saying, like, it's ridiculous. Like, Zorge, you know, the, the idea of Zorge is uh, of, a, of a communist spy is, is ridiculous. It's a provocation. And Ott himself also refuses to believe it. Had Zorge accepted the, the Germans' offer um, of uh, a diplomatic post, he would have had diplomatic immunity. The Japanese would not have been able to arrest him, uh, particularly because they were allies. The question is, you know, what would the Germans then have done with him, you know, in, in wartime Japan? Anyway, but um, the, he was not a diplomat. Um, he was arrested. Uh, Zorge was arrested and he was interrogated. He held out for a while, but confronted with sort of overwhelming evidence and material evidence because lots of spy uh, materials, you know, transcripts of um, uh, translations of various military reports and, you know, all this paraphernalia of information that had been gathered by the, by the spy ring had been picked up among its members. It was more or less impossible for Zorge to deny it. And eventually he, he confesses, and he more than confesses. He writes a very long prison memoir uh, kind of autobiography, and all the time he's uh, convinced that the Soviets are going to somehow rescue him. They're going to get him out. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, they never do. They completely <laughs> ignore him, and they abandon him to his fate. And do, they, do the Japanese have a, a fair and open trial, or is it a, a kangaroo court? Well, one of the odd things about, um, about uh, this period of, of Japanese history is that you have, you know, all of the democratic institutions are, uh, have been totally eviscerated. The country is basically being run by, by the military by this point, by 1941. But at the same time, you have a, a curiously thorough investigation. I mean, I don't think you, you could call it a fair trial by any stretch of the imagination. But nonetheless, the prosecutor goes to great lengths to gather all the forensic information and uh, assembles a massive file as a huge investigative effort. I mean, partly, of course, that's less in the interests of justice and more in the interests of uh, you know, trying to assess the damage that this spy has yeah. done. The trial went on for several days, and um, Zorge was... Zorge's activities were listed in, in enormous and forensic detail. And most curiously uh, and bizarrely, it turned out at the trial, it was revealed at the trial, that the, the Japanese had in fact been intercepting Zorge's radio communications since 1934. So from the very beginning of Zorge spy ring, the Japanese intelligence had been intercepting this mysterious signal coded and uh, they didn't know where it was coming from, but they intercepted it and they transcribed it. So for, for seven years, the Japanese were writing down these endless streams of, letter, of, of, of code, letter codes in Morse code 
and just transcribing it with no, no idea what the key was. And it was only when they arrested Max Clausen, who was the radio operator, Moscow-trained German communist radio operator who was sent out by the, uh, uh, by the Soviets to uh, assist Zorge. It was only when they arrested him and they discovered a rather well-thumbed copy of the 1935 Statistical Almanac, which was the code book which was the, the, the letter code that they used in their communications with Moscow, that they were able to decipher this enormous stack of papers that they've been accumulating since 1934 without being able to read it. It was so Japanese. <laughs> they, just, they just kept at it you know, in the hope that eventually somehow they would be able to decipher it. So in the event uh, when Zorge came to trial, uh, it turns out that uh, the Japanese were very well informed because they had intercepted basically all of his messages. You know, it is such a remarkable story. How is he remembered in Russia today? Indeed, is he remembered in Russia today? Yeah, he's very much remembered, actually. Uh, there's a sort of strange posthumous story. I'm, I, I, sorry if this is a spoiler, but the Japanese hang him on Revolution Day in 1944 in Sugamo Prison, uh, completely abandoned by the Soviets. The Soviets don't acknowledge him, and it's only until in the 1960s when uh, a film is made, a film is made by a uh, French director called Who Are You, Dr. Zorge? And it's shown at the Moscow Film Festival, strangely enough, and, and Khrushchev, Nikita Khrushchev sees it and he says, who is this man? He very quickly becomes rehabilitated, Zorge, as a Soviet hero because 1962, the Berlin Wall is just going up. There's huge tensions over Berlin with Kennedy. So the, the Soviet propaganda needs a good anti-Nazi German communist as a hero. And Zorge fits the bill. So uh, Zorge sort of is suddenly pulled out uh, um, of his obscurity. He was given the, the posthumously the or the a hero of the Soviet Union, and a whole slew of, of books comes out during that period. And then again, he's rehabilitated in the in the late seventies because in the late seventies, Yuri Andropov, um, the, the chairman of the KGB, is sort of uh, angling for to succeed Lenin Brezhnev, and so they need you know a hero KGB man. Although, of course, uh, Zorge never worked for the KGB. He was with the military intelligence. But anyway, so in the 70s, there's another sort of slew of sort of hero worshipping of Zorge that comes out. To answer your question, he's very well known uh, because he was a you know, sort of staple Soviet hero, which people would have read about growing up in the Soviet Union. And once again, actually last year, uh, an incredibly terrible um, television film was made by Russian television, but very high budget. And again, sort of extolling the, the virtues of this sort of great hero... Uh, hero spy, because of course, uh, you know, spies have been, uh, been running Russia for some time now, and they, you know, they, and, and, they, and they like they like stories of hero spies. There's a, a street named after him in Baku. There's a street named after him in Moscow. There's statues in Moscow and Baku. Um, you know, he, he's uh, there are ships named after him. He was on stamps, so he was like an official official hero. Fantastic! It is an amazing story. Well, um, thank you for that, loyal listener. If you want to know more. And there is so much more to know about Sorge, womanising, drinking, how the cell operated in Tokyo. The book is An Impeccable Spy, Richard Sorge, Stalin's Master Agent by Owen Matthews. I will put a link on the website. As I said at the start, it's well worth a read. Well, that's it for this episode. I think next time out, as it's the 75th anniversary, we should be looking at Operation Varsity, the largest airborne operation in history. So that's it for now. I'm Angus Wallace and thanks for listening.